Hi, my name is Aubrey edwards Luce, and I'm the Senior Director um, of Child Welfare and Youth Justice at First Focus on Children. Thank you so much for joining us today. As we're engaging in this conversation on kids and COVID, I am delighted to be joined with uh, a fantastic uh, cast of, of panelists. Um, but first, let me introduce my co-facilitator today, um, Tony Parsons, who is the Federalist Policy Specialist at Youth Villages. Hey, Tony. Hey, Aubrey, thank you so much for having me on with you today. I, I have Aubrey, it's my, it's my honor to be here with some fantastic uh, panelists who are going to have a great, great discussion. As Aubrey said, my name is Tony Parsons, the Federal Policy Specialist for Youth Villages. And I think that, um, you know, we have a very unique, uh, between Aubrey, myself, and the panelists, a very unique perspective on kids and COVID and just some of the things that we've seen in the juvenile justice as well as the foster care systems. But more on that later. I think. Um, Aubrey's going to do some introductions before we get too deep into this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we uh, kind of get into the meat of what we're talking today, let me introduce who we have with us here um, around the table. We've got um, Allison Green, who's here with us from the National Association for the Council of Children. She is the legal director there. We have James Dold, who's the CEO and founder of Human Rights for Kids. Thanks for being here with us today, James. We've got Jennifer Rodriguez, the executive director of Youth Law Center. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, Joshua Josh Rovner, um, Joshua, if you're formal, um, he's the senior advocacy associate at the sentencing um, project. And last but certainly not least, we have Shreen White, who is the director of advocacy and policy at Children's Rights. Hey, Shreen. Hey folks, so like before I get started, let me just do a little bit of level setting. So today we're here talking about um, the impact that the COVID pandemic had on children and youth and families in the child welfare and youth justice system. So I will be using the words youth justice system um, as much as I possibly can to really um, emphasize the need to change our thinking about juveniles and just the carceral system and remember that um, all kids need to be treated as kids. Um, when we're talking about the child welfare system, um, what I'm talking primarily about is the foster care system, what a lot of folks know as foster care. Approximately like 440,000 children are in the foster care system, um, almost possibly double that total number if you're thinking about the hidden foster care system or just all the number of youth who and children who are investigated by um, what's called the Child Protective Services system. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about like how youth come into this system and how children come into the system and um, how that changed during the pandemic. And then on the youth justice side, we have approximately um, 44,000 children who um, have some type of interaction with the criminal justice system um, or are in the, the youth justice um, court system purview a year. So, um, Let's let me see if Tony, did you have anything that you wanted to add a little bit on on helping us kind of get ready for this conversation? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I think we need to really keep in context as we're having this discussion today um, is, you know, this pandemic is obviously we are living through a pandemic, right? It's not over. But I think this pandemic did a lot to really set the stage for not only this discussion, but much a much broader discussion on how we interact and how we help and how we support those in the youth justice system and the child welfare system. Because the pandemic did not create necessarily new problems. All it did is exasperate problems that we knew existed and finally brought them to the forefront and say, we can no longer wait, right? We have to address these. And unfortunately it took us to a place, uh, it took us until lives were literally being lost left, right and center because of the pandemic to start dealing with some of these structural and big issues that we need to be dealing with and that we can deal with because we've seen that we can do it when we come together and have those discussions and make good policy and make good decisions. Um, but I also say this, I think the pandemic did a great thing in the sense of it finally gave everybody who isn't necessarily part of the child welfare system or isn't a part of the youth justice system, it came to it kind of put us all on one level to say like, look, this is how it feels like to have no control of your life. This is what it feels like to be scared to have your basic needs met because for the first time, every American was going through something together. And unfortunately, uh, even in the best times, those in our youth justice system and those in our child welfare system are typically forgotten and overlooked. And so this was the time for them to kind of come to the center. And I think every American felt for just a moment what these young people are feeling every day. And so as we have this discussion, let's not forget that feeling that we all felt. And let's not forget that these young people are still feeling it, even as we are starting to move out of this pandemic. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for, for doing that, Tony. It's such an important thing for us to keep in mind. This isn't over. And um, unfortunately, many of the children and youth who are in these systems have been dealing with a lot of these struggles for a time that even um, preceded the pandemic. So we're going to jump into a couple of different um, big discussion topics. Um, we're going to start off, off with um, the topic of like mandated reporting and maltreatment data. So what I'm talking about here is the way that um, children and youth come into the, the foster care system specifically is that there is a report of either child abuse or neglect that's made to the child welfare agency. Um, and we've seen a lot of information um, those of us who are paying attention to this this area about how those numbers fluctuated like prior to the pandemic what were they like after the pandemic um and we've definitely seen some 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 um opinions i will say that the number of child abuse and neglect um instances fell during the pandemic so i want to just pose this question to um anyone in in our conversation who wants to jump in maybe allison or shireen um or, or or Jennifer, tell us what do you think about like how the statistics change and what what are you um, considering as you're making the assessment? Do you, did you want to start, Allison, or you want me to set us up? Um, you go ahead, Shereen. I'll, I'll go next. <laughs> okay. Well, um, first, Tony and um, Aubrey, thank you so much for setting the stage for why we're here and. Um, you know, that we're still going through through this pandemic, it's important. I, I can start with some framing um, for this particular question because it's a complicated one. Um, when we think about the child welfare system, there are so many narratives about the system. And depending on who you ask or what you read, the narrative is gonna be really different as it relates to what the system does, who it impacts and why it impacts certain people versus others. And when the pandemic started back in 2020, March, 2020, um, we saw this new narrative being created. And I kind of have summed it up as the panic narrative uh, that children will no longer be in schools. They'll no longer be under the surveillance of educators, school personnel, uh, which we know educators and school personnel are one of the top three reporters of child abuse and neglect. And instead, children are going to be spending more time at home with their families. And because we're in the middle of a pandemic, obviously, there are going to be a lot of high stresses and pressures, including economic stress and pressures, health related and job related things going on. So that narrative was that when we come out of this, we're going to see a real uptick in child maltreatment. And fast forward, we now have some initial data that was released back in February of this year, the Children's Bureau uh, published their Child Maltreatment 2020 report. And that report provides national level data on abuse and neglect at different phases or stages of the child welfare system. And this national data showed that there was in fact a decrease in a lot of areas. I think we could have expected that there would be a decrease in the number of reports made to CPS hotlines about child abuse and neglect because children were not going to school, they were at home. And so there was a decrease in the number of reports. There was a decrease in uh, the number of reports that were substantiated for abuse and neglect. And there was an overall decline in maltreatment in those first few months in 2020 of the pandemic and an overall decline in the number of child fatalities that, that we saw. So that's on a national level overall data. And then I think when you look at the state level data, there's a mix. There are some jurisdictions that are assessing their data now and finding that their data is very much in line with national data, that there is a decrease in the number of kids in foster care. For example, I think in Oregon, in New York, um, New York did an entire series about the data that they've been able to look at thus far in terms of uh, number of children impacted and by child abuse and neglect um, during the pandemic. And in New York, just at, like at the national level, all of those numbers went down. In other places, I think people are assessing their data and seeing that there was an increase. So this is an interesting topic and area, and I think it's something that's gonna continue to evolve and people are, are going to continue to analyze the data and really try to get a sense of 
how COVID has and is impacting abuse and neglect findings. And I'll add one more thing, which is that, you know, during this time, we've really met the challenges of the pandemic with some really key and critical supports for children and families, which also may be impacting these the data and the numbers we see. And it's important to keep those things in mind. For example, there was a whole moratorium on evictions. And we know that there are so many people that enter the child welfare system because of lack of housing. And during the pandemic, families received um, economic impact payments and the child tax credit. So there were a number of things um, that came together to really benefit children and families during this time as well. Yeah. I don't know if Allison or Jennifer want to add something. Oh, sure, you covered so much of it. Um, I think obviously the data is still emerging and experts are trying to draw broad conclusions that are difficult to draw. However, um, as Shree noted, the federal data and some local data really does show that those initial predictions that there was going to be an extreme spike in child abuse or that when schools reopened, there would be this giant rebound effect uh, with kids coming back um, into schools and being called in and removed into care. Those fears didn't pan out. And so now two years later, where does that leave us as, as a child welfare community? I think it, it should prompt some reflection about why those were why those were initial responses and those initial responses were so readily picked up in the media um, and how those responses may have inadvertently caused more fear in, in families. Uh, if you're a family and you're seeing a narrative that children are not safe in their home, how do, does that lead you to want to reach out when you, you, you may need help? So I think this is just a good moment of reflection two years later to look at some of this data, some of which is included in the resources uh, for today's session, um, specifically the maltreatment report from ACF, which Shireen noted, um, Anna Aaron's article on uh, New York City, um, and some research from Dr. Allison Stevens and Robert Segge. Um, so I would encourage everyone to look at those, evaluate them, and also try to reflect about what, what were our initial thoughts conceptions or even misconceptions about what would happen when the old way of being stopped being and and where might we have been wrong and have room to grow in our own thinking because of that. Yeah. Thanks so much for for that, Allison and Shereen. Um, I want to pull in some of our um, youth justice system experts too. Um, kind of moving away from like the beginning stages of, of youth youth justice involvement, um, we know that sometimes youth can end up in group homes and detention centers and under other congregate care settings. Um, how did that practice change during the pandemic? Like wh what shifts did, did we see in those settings? Um, would Josh or James wanna, yeah, go ahead, Josh. Oh, I think you might be muted, my friend. And I no longer am. Thank you so much. You know, we really did see a lot fewer kids being admitted to the uh, youth justice facilities and a higher number of releases as well. You know, social distancing is basically impossible in the congregate care setting. And in the pandemic emergency, there was an understanding that there were too many kids in these facilities. Now, this is something advocates have been saying forever, and it remains true. But there was actually something very hopeful in the fact that when an emergency hit the system, that there was a recognition that we didn't need to lock up as many kids and many of the kids who were in the facilities could go home. Now, at the same time, many of the kids were still in there and we only saw the racial and ethnic disparities get worse, you know, as they were judging who did not need to be locked up. It seemed as though kids who looked like mine were more likely to be allowed to go home, uh, which was really a troubling aspect of this. And a secondary uh, impact was that there was uh, vast limitations on visitation, trying to keep the virus out of the facility. So that meant not only that families couldn't visit, but outside programming, counseling, education, just couldn't take place. So within the facilities, things were really much worse. And I think for the kids who were in there, it was a terrifying time as it was for the rest of us, um, but they were lacking in the information, they were lacking uh, the programming to help them uh, cope with what was going on. Yeah, yeah. And James, maybe you can share with us a little bit, like what were the repercussions of that? Like what were what were young people enduring as a result of um, the inability for 
these facilities to continue um, programming and um, visitation and some sense of normalcy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and thank you, Aubrey, uh, for, for hosting us today and um, to all my fellow panelists as well. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. I think it's also important to set the stage too when we're talking about youth and the justice system. I think for, for so many of us who operate in the space, you know, there was this sort of dismay that I think a lot of us felt in the beginning of the pandemic because so much of the rhetoric that was coming out was really focused on what people termed, you know, the most at risk communities from COVID-19. And, and uh, because some of the early data seemed to indicate that children weren't as severely impacted by the virus, uh, more uh, community communities of kids that were more at risk were kind of left by the wayside, right? And that's something that we had to try to push back on very early on in the pandemic, this notion that, you know, youth who were in secure facilities or in uh, group home settings weren't at risk uh, from co developing complications from COVID-19. And we know that's the case because we know that, you know, children who have high ACE scores or have been exposed to severe amounts of trauma um, tend to have uh, greater complications in the health setting, right? So we know that when we look at youth in particular, in the juvenile and adult criminal legal system, they have higher incidence of diabetes, asthma, pneumonia, uh, suffering from hypertension. All of these things exacerbate uh, what happens with the virus. And so there needed to be a lot of public education on the forefront. And what we started to see was, you know, to your question, um, you know, the evaporation of, of these basic due process protections. So we saw parents and children in these situations where they were having to kind of face this Sophie's choice of sorts, where it was like, you know, you can either plead guilty or admit that, you know, there was some sort of wrongdoing, forego your constitutional rights uh, in order to, you know, be released from a detention facility, you know, pending the outcome of your case uh, or, um, you know, roll the dice and see what happens if you end up getting sick uh, from COVID-19. And for a lot of kids who had some of these severe uh, health afflictions like severe asthma and whatnot, that was a very terrifying prospect for a lot of kids. And so we saw parents and their children being faced with, you know, these very, you know, terrible uh, decisions as it were. Um, and then there were some parents and children who really had no choice you know, particularly for youth who were charged as adults who were being held oftentimes in adult facilities, uh, sometimes in violation of, of federal law, like the Prison Rape Elimination Act, uh, being stuck in a situation where um, because they were facing serious charges in adult court, they, you know, there was no uh, remedy to try to get those folks home, um, even though they hadn't been convicted of a crime. And so that was, you know, I think in my mind, one of the big points that really jump out to me as far as the you know, the evaporation of these constitutional rights that, that you know, are in place for youth. And there was a huge backlog that happened as well. It was, it, ironically, as a quick side note, I was actually serving on a jury in the District of Columbia at the point when the pandemic broke out. And so I saw sort of firsthand how uh, the entire legal system sort of came came to a screeching halt. And mm -hmm. what ended up happening in this case, it was, a, it was a murder case of all things. I don't know how I got on this jury, um, but, but, you know, they ended up keeping us in abeyance uh, after the, after the pandemic sent, you know, all the court staff home. And it wasn't until six, seven months later that they finally declared a mistrial. Right. And so that was, you know, with adults in adult court. But again, we have a lot of kids who are pending trial who hadn't even reached the stage of going through the trial process. And so it really just backed up the courts in the juvenile system, in the adult system uh, for kids who had their cases heard there. And it, you know, again, resulted in the, this very terrifying moment for parents and kids that, you know, they were going to be faced with this rapidly spreading virus in this very uh, terrible setting that was conducive to allowing the virus to spread, all the while having a lot of the underlying health conditions that exacerbate uh, the virus in those settings. And so it was a, it was a very uh, traumatic event uh, just having to go through that for many, for many children and, and their parents. Yeah, that's um, that's so hard to hear and, I, and, and so hard to see. I don't, Jennifer, did you wanna weigh in on this too? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I, I feel like this, um, this topic is one that really falls under what Tony sort of set out for us, which is this is an area where, you know, before the pandemic hit, we all were well aware of the dangers of confinement, the dangers of institutionalization. And I know your question was specific to the youth justice system, but actually the answer applies to both the youth justice system and the use of group care and institutional care and, and child welfare as well. 
Um, I think that people were, you know, we, we've had decades of research that lay out for us what the harms are for children's uh, physical health, for their mental health, for all of the life outcomes that we want to see our young people achieve. And COVID, just the pandemic added one more real risk. Um, and I feel like this was a real missed opportunity um, for both child welfare and juvenile justice. At the beginning of the pandemic, we had this window where there was the beginning of some real creative thinking about, okay, do we really need to have young people in these settings? Is there any place they could be and be safe and where the community could be safe other than in detention or institutional care? And, and you know, that is a youth by youth individual kind of analysis. And people started to do that work um, at the beginning. But it is hard work and it requires sort of sustained attention and care to it. Um, and to me, it, it's the work of reform of both systems, right? It's reimagining where are the places that our youth can be so that every young person can be in a family, in their community and supported. Um, so we, we started to do that work. And, and I, I just want to echo what um, what both Josh and James were saying about sort of the, the context that we were doing that work in, because, you know, all of the problems that exist with detention and institutional care, that this was nothing like what we had seen before. We saw young people placed in isolation and solitary confinement to deal with pandemic outbreaks for for days, in some cases, months. We saw uh, staffing shortages across facilities that meant that young people were not you know, receiving food, they weren't receiving care, nobody was monitoring um, whether they were okay or not. Um, all of the, those lack of access to services, these are already young people that are isolated and that problem got so much worse. Um, so I just wanna say like, we are still in this pandemic and what became crystal clear to everyone, if it wasn't already, is none of these places are places for children to grow up. Um, and so whether we're talking about um, an ongoing public health disaster or I'm here in California and we had a whole series of climate related disasters that I think we can be sure are going to be part of our futures moving forward where people had to evacuate. I think everyone got the message that the future really requires us to navigate with family, with community, and that's just not possible for youth who are in an institutional setting. So we as a system have to do better. And, and I think that's really important because the systems were under such strain um, during the pandemic that what I have seen happen across both child welfare and juvenile justice is a real regression. Um, towards the, the sort of headway we were making to say, let's end the use of incarceration, let's end the use of institutional care. I mean, systems are under strain, and so they sort of reverted back to, we just need beds. We need beds and places to put children, but our children are not going to survive the next coming decades with that kind of treatment. Um, so there was a missed opportunity. There's much that we can learn from for those youth who um, we developed diversion from the system successfully, for who we were able to place with either their own family or an alternate family in their community, and the youth who we were able to be creative and say, do they really still need to be in institutional care? Do they still need to be incarcerated? Or is there a place that they can be out in the community? Those are the questions we need to keep asking ourselves moving forward for every single young person. Yeah, I definitely agree with uh, with that, uh, Jennifer. I think there's a lot that we're going to take out of this pandemic if we ever get out of this pandemic and get to whatever this new normal, I guess we'll call it, will be. Um, and I think one of the greatest areas that we've really learned a lot of lessons, both positively and negatively, um, has been in our legal system itself and, and how we conduct court proceedings as it relates to young people uh, in the youth justice and, 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 and the foster care system. And so I want to talk you know, to some of our lawyers here. We are blessed to have a lot of lawyers on our panelists and someone who wanted to be a lawyer at one time, uh, not so much anymore, but we'll talk about that another time. I would really love to know your, your all of your thoughts on like how do we think that you know the, the pandemic really impacted court proceedings both positively and negatively right i mean we can't say everything about the pandemic is bad although it was um there have probably been some positives to come out of this so you know to my lawyers out there or those really who work in the legal system if you're not a lawyer you know what have be, what has been the impact of the pandemic on our legal proceedings um you know both from a positive and a negative perspective and then 
you know, are the things we should be taking forward with this as we adjust to whatever the new normal is going to be in this country? Oh, you're muted. Maybe I can start off with talking about it. Am I muted? You're good. Now you're good. Now you're good. Okay. Um, so the, the first and most obvious change was just virtual hearings in general. And now that certain places are coming back, many jurisdictions are working through this open question of are virtual hearings a part of our future? And when I've heard many people ask, like, are these a good thing or a bad thing? And my take on it is they're not all good or all bad. Virtual hearings have their place um, and might in some instances be an innovation that helps court be more accessible. For who? For parents who don't have the time to take off a full day of work to sit in a waiting room in a court. For youth who wanna participate virtually might be more comfortable uh, participating from their home or in an environment where they have more comfortable items around them. Um, they might also be an innovation for courts that were struggling beforehand to have time set hearings, uh, but finally figured out how to do that. Um, at the same time, I don't think we wanna move towards a future that is solely virtual hearings because there's a lot that cannot be accomplished in a virtual hearing. In, in order to really champion every party's rights in court, attorneys need to be able to test evidence. Then that means they need to be able to call witnesses and judges need to be able to assess the credibility of those witnesses. Often attorneys and their clients need to be able to confer during court, um, whisper to each other or step outside together to um, align on something or figure out a question. And that was much, much harder in the virtual space. Um, so looking ahead, I think this is gonna be another time for us to think critically about not treating every family the same, not treating every child the same, but working through it on a case-by-case -case basis. And longer hearings, hearings that have are evidentiary in nature should probably all come back in person. Um, but there may be times where review hearings or shorter status hearings can be accomplished virtually um, and may be more accessible to families to be uh, done virtually. Um, in fact, this might be a way to accelerate return home for youth um, so that when a child returns home, it's as soon as it is safely possible for them to do so, not because they're just waiting around for the next court hearing, which isn't scheduled for a month or two months, um, but really scheduling court events around the youth um, rather than around the system. Yeah, I'd like to add a little something in here about this. I was looking at a state, I was looking at South Carolina a while ago and the overuse of detention there. And the number one reason that kids are held in detention in South Carolina or what are called administrative holds. And that's generally a failure to appear in court. Um, now, when I have a dentist appointment, my dentist pesters me six or seven times, you know, via text message, email, uh, every way that they can reach me. The idea that we can have kids appear in court this way could make a huge difference in reducing the use of detention. Um, certainly South Carolina doesn't have to do it that way, but they do. Uh, so I do see some potential there to, to decrease the use of detention, and uh, I hope that that will continue. I, before we leave this question, I, I want to jump back to child welfare, and one particular proceeding, court proceeding, that I want to lift up is um, the termination of parental right hearings and what was going to happen with those hearings in the midst of, an, of a pandemic, right? Were states just going to keep moving forward business as usual and, you know, long-term separating children and families, even in the midst of um, difficulty accessing services, um, meeting whatever the case plan goals were, um, a lack of visits. And, you know, I haven't seen a ton um, in terms of what states have done for TPR, but what did come out was the Children's Bureau back in 2020 did um, provide some guidance to states to say, this is an issue you should be looking at. Please assess, you know, what's happening. Um, do parents have access to services? Are they able to meet their goals? And do this assessment before you move forward with terminating parental rights. And Rep. Gwendolyn Moore on uh, the federal level, Rep. Gwen Moore, she introduced a bill, legislation that would stop 
the TPR timelines and put a pause on them in the midst of the pandemic. And that legislation didn't go anywhere. I, I tried to do at some point some research to see if any states enacted policies or change you know, practices uh, as far as TPR was concerned. And I think that there were probably a mix of state reactions and responses, but I haven't seen anything super specific, but I wanted to lift that up that you know, that's one proceeding, court proceeding, where some people may have had their parental rights terminated in the midst of a pandemic, and maybe other jurisdictions were more sensitive to what people were experiencing during this time. And I want to jump in and um, talk about sort of the other end of the timeline that, that then from what Shireen just covered, which is for young people who are in extended foster care. Um, and I think this is a group of, of young people that really falls under what Allison mentioned earlier around, you know, this, this actually ended up being an innovation um, for many of them. And again, it did require, at least in California, one of the very first actions that was taken was to make sure that every single young person in foster care, child or youth, had access um, to a device and access to internet across the state. That was sort of like pandemic action item number one. Um, and we were able to do that through executive order and coordination of a number of public agencies and private agencies through the state. And I think this is a perfect example of the kind of um, sort of change moment that the system was forced into, both foster care and juvenile justice. I mean, we know internet is basically a utility at this point. We rely on it for everything, but there was real hesitation in both systems to giving young people access. I mean, in both systems, it's often still talked about as contraband or young people's access is limited. And then we came into the pandemic and everyone suddenly caught up to the moment in time that we're in and said, wait a second, this is like a gateway to young people's relationships with their siblings, with their family, with their extended family. This is key for their education. Um, this is going to be really important to be able to do visits with social workers to be able to participate in court. And actually all of these things, you know, for the most part were already true before the pandemic, but folks just realized suddenly. Um, and so everyone got wired. And for young people who were in extended foster care, the ability both to not have to spend an entire day out of their very busy lives and, you know, disrupt work and school um, to do court check-ins one, um, you know, meant that many of them were able to participate when they hadn't been previously in their, their court hearings, which also allowed them to start doing some accountability around holding their, their lawyers accountable for the kind of representation that they wanted to see. But also we heard from many, many young people that it equalized some of the power dynamics that they felt sort of showing up in a courtroom and, you know, having all of these folks who they considered to be intimidating professionals around them and being, you know, queried by by a judge when everyone is an equal. I remember one young person said, everyone was an equal square, <laughs> same size on the screen. Um, and I felt much more able to participate in decisions about my life. And I think that really is an important um, access point that I hope we don't leave um, as more things open up into person is that we should really be giving young people choices. There may be instances that it's important um, to be in person, either relationally or because of the topic, but there is an option um, that we should be able to use and integrate into our systems. And I'll just add a couple of points for for youth at sort of the the far end of the spectrum who might not be youth anymore. Um, so you know we try to broadly conceptualize youth in the system to, for those people who maybe came in as children for uh, crimes that they committed as children and then have received an adult sentence and so now they're older. Um, they could be you know in their 30s, 40s, 50s. One of the populations I think a lot about here is the juvenile lifer population. And in recent years, uh, a number of states have enacted what are known as second look reforms and. Uh, those are essentially reforms that allow uh, either the parole board or through the, the courts, uh, lawyers to come in and file motions for uh, sentence modification. And so I think one of the things that's really been useful in that context is innovative lawyering that has allowed folks to bring in expert witnesses that they might not have been able to bring in before uh, because they're in different parts of the country or allowing families to participate virtually through those hearings that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do because they have trouble uh, trans uh, 
transporting to and from uh, the circuit or district court, wherever they might be located. So I think that, that that's been one real innovative process that's that's happened during the pandemic. I also want to talk about youth who are, um, you know, in who were in juvenile detention facilities or were committed uh, uh, to the state. I think one of the things that was sort of a bit of a hodgepodge as we sort of the, as the pandemic got going was, you know, how state courts were going to really respond uh, to this moment. And I really think of this as like one of the golden moments for public defenders and defense attorneys around the country who started filing these emergency motions uh, for the courts to begin to decarcerate their their uh, state populations of, of kids in the system. And, you know, I think that was met with varying degrees of success. I think perhaps one of the most successful examples of this actually happened in Maryland where um, the Juvenile Public Defender's Office filed one of these emergency motions. It was denied by the Court of Appeals. However, the Court of Appeals subsequently, about a week or two later, issued significant guidance to the lower courts, which uh, drastically ended up drastically reducing the number of kids who were in commitment and detention. And so, you know, roughly two thirds of the kids in Maryland had been in for uh, misdemeanors or, um, or um, uh, probation violations. And what we ended up seeing was about a 40% drop in overall commitment and detention of youth as a result of uh, the specific guidance that was issued by the Court of Appeals. And that was that, uh, you know, essentially encouraging lower courts to, to not use uh, detention or commitment unless the child posed a threat to public safety. And then the other requirement being that every two weeks or every 14 days, uh, courts were required to go through um, another hearing to determine whether or not uh, the child's uh, continued detention still served public safety interests. And I think the combination of those two things really led to this very significant decline um, in, in Maryland's population. So, you know, to the extent that I think we can kind of keep that same uh, mindset, I think that's going to be the challenge of the movement continuing to move forward and get more states to adopt that so that you know, we always think of commitment or detention as a means of last resort and only um, if it's absolutely essential for public safety measures. And I think if we can do that, we'll see more and more kids uh, removed from these secured uh, settings. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. I, all of you, there was a, those are some fantastic responses. One of the things that I'm really trickling up is like, you know, it's an innovation in not just how we do things, but how we think about how we can do things. Um, and going back to a point that I believe Jennifer made about like the internet being a utility, I think that also exposed a lot of equity issues within this country, right? If you live in a city, you're more likely to be able to have access to the internet. But if you live in rural Pennsylvania, rural Oklahoma, right, you're not going to necessarily have it. And so, you know, I always consider like, you know, while I think we did take some steps forward, um, you know, in being able to provide internet access to young people, to families, what have you, I do think we also left some people out in the cold doing that as well, because that just isn't available everywhere. Like youth villages, we serve people across 24 different states. And I can remember talking to one of our young people in our life set program who would have to sit in his pickup truck in the, in the um, parking lot of a McDonald's to get online to do his coursework because he lived in that, that much of a rural community. Right. And so while I think some of these interventions and some of these innovations will take forward with us, I think we also need to keep in mind, like there is an equity issue that needs to be addressed in, when doing those sorts of things. And when we're thinking of interventions um, as we continue to adjust whatever this new normal will be. And, you know, while it's great to see that there's been a lot of federal policy moves to make Internet more accessible uh, across the nation with the bipartisan infrastructure plan and other things like that. It is such an equity issue um, that I just don't think we can ignore. Um, that we definitely couldn't ignore in the past, but we definitely can't ignore moving forward as things continue to get online. Um, yeah. Yeah. Aubrey, did you want to chime in? I think you wanted to add something. Yeah, I just, I also had one of, what I'm hearing too is like um, a similar equity issue, but kind of on a different topic, right? On how do we, how do we view families? So like, mm -hmm. how are we viewing families as being safe enough or children being like safe enough to be released into the community? Um, are we, I think we already had this issue kind of before the pandemic in terms of um, the way that we conceptualize of, of families and in both of these systems, right? It's disproportionately um, black, brown and native um, children and families that are involved here. And so I feel like this was a different kind of equity issue um, that just kind of magnified itself and raised the stakes, um, right? This is, especially for like the youth that James were talking about, you know, it's, it's, um, 
it it feels much more like a life and death, even if you're not necessarily facing like a, a sentence that might carry that. But because of those, um, the, the health risks that were posed by the pandemic, um, it, things felt much more severe or like how Shireen was talking about the TPR, right? It's like the, the child welfare death sentence equivalent. Um, how we view what families are doing to keep their their capacity to keep their children and youth safe, I think also was um, elucidated um, and the stakes raised during the pandemic. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, I think that some of these things like I think you had it right on the head, Aubrey, right? Like this, the stakes were raised um, just across the board on so, so many different things. Um, you know, and, and speaking of, you know, raising stakes, I think that um, one of the things that we don't talk about a lot is like this, this, this idea of surveillance, right? And like, how did supervision need to change during the pandemic, right? Um, whether you're a young person who's, you know, specifically I'm thinking of young people who may have been on probation, but like, because you couldn't actually do things in person, right? It just wasn't safe. But the stakes are so high, we don't want to see young people slip up. We want to make sure they are getting the supports they need. And so I'd really love to talk about, like, how did supervision, you know, under whether it be probation or even those mandatory caseworker visits, how did that change during the pandemic? You know, and like, what did it have to look like for it to still happen? Um, I know we've got a very, very, uh, varied perspectives on that. So I'd love to kind of talk about that a little bit more. You know what, I think I'd like to chime in here one aspect of this. It's just important to realize the extent to which probation for kids is just a trap that puts them deeper and deeper into the system. You know, Maryland is coming closer to changing its law, but right now kids get put on indefinite terms of probation. And the terms of probation could be, you know, taking drug tests, despite the fact that the underlying charge wasn't a drug charge, or truancy could violate the terms of your probation or any number of other things. And what ends up happening is that one out of seven kids who are in these facilities on a typical day aren't there because if they committed a, a crime. It's because they violated the terms of their probation on the kinds of things that we're talking about. So the all-encompassing way that supervision just keeps kids in the system instead of sort of moving them on, recognizing that, you know, kids are going to make mistakes that are not criminal in nature. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we really have to take out of this time of realizing that we need to move kids out of the system once they're done with it. And these indefinite terms that you see in places like Maryland really need to stop. You know, I just wanna point out, Tony, that even the way you frame the question about surveillance is I think that that is what got brought to the attention of at least some stakeholders in the system during the pandemic is that what was happening was in fact surveillance when it shouldn't have been, right? Like those, those opportunities where surveillance was happening were really supposed to be about case management that helps people get their needs met, that helps them grow, that provide something of value and sitting back and watching does not provide anything of value. And so I think, you know, where the absence of surveillance created a problem for, for systems was they weren't able to do their sort of duty. They couldn't write the court report. They couldn't report to higher ups. They couldn't document what was there, but those things are not meaningful for children and families. What's really meaningful is like, did you get the help that you needed? Um, and I know we dealt with this in, in many jurisdictions as people were struggling in foster care with visitation um, and saying like, you know, well, virtual contact and relationships, they don't count for the purposes of, you know, moving towards reunification. And we were saying, why not? I mean, we brought in researchers who were showing you can sustain relationships through virtual contact. It's not obviously ideal to do that, but you can do it. And folks were saying, well, we didn't get a chance to watch it. We didn't get a chance to surveil the contact between. And so then we really had to ask, what are systems doing during these visits? Are they supporting parenting time and sort of teaching helpful skills and techniques and encouraging families? Are they helping children and youth deal with the trauma of separation? Or are they just sitting back and taking notes? And I think what we learned was for the most part, 
surveillance, lack of surveillance is a problem for the system. It's not a problem for young people and families. So we really need to be able to make sure that anytime we are having an interaction with a young person or a family, we're adding value for them and we're, we're helping moving forward. Um, surveillance is something that, you know, again, that, that is not, it is just not something that um, young people and families really missed during, during the pandemic. You know, Jennifer like really nailed it on on that point. And it just makes me think about one like fundamental learning that we all should be taking away from this, which is that the question of how we help families, right? And we need to fundamentally change how we support families. And you can't support families by surveilling them. And I think what Jennifer said really just like hit that in a nutshell. So I wanted, I wanted to put that out there in terms of how we fundamentally support children and families and surveillance is not the answer for that. I would also like to add, uh, when we're talking about surveillance here, um, a lot of the concerns I was hearing from our members at NACC during the pandemic were not concerns about a lack of surveillance of families. They were concerned about youth already in foster care and how they were suffering and the amount of isolation they were experiencing while in foster care. Um, they were concerned about the lack of surveillance of youth who were in a foster home, or maybe they didn't really have any bond or emotional connection. Um, maybe they slept there at night, but school was their main outlet or being on a sports team was their lifeline and they lost that. And, and all of a sudden they were siloed with a group of people that they didn't really know that well for a very long period of time during an extremely stressful global pandemic. Um, I think we've seen, and I know First Focus has covered in its other uh, webinars, you know, the impact on youth mental health during this time has been severe. Um, so when we think about surveillance, we, we have to not only just think about potential surveillance of families outside the system in order to bring them in, but surveillance of actually what is going on in foster care mm -hmm. uh, and, and making sure that youth have access to advocates um, to, to get them what they need when they need it. That's so, such a good point, Alice. And um, I was hearing similar things on, on the youth justice side as well about, um, you know, I think we kind of touched on this. Jennifer talked about this, like the use of, of solitary confinement as like a medical, <laughs> like, uh, way of helping to promote public health um, and the impact that that had on, on young people's mental health, right? Just all of the isolation that happened and needing to make sure that there was opportunity for, for people who were actually there to, to do something differently, right? We weren't just there to like check in on, on the child and see what they're doing, but to check on the child and see what they needed mm -hmm. um, and to provide them the supports and the advocacy that they needed to make their, their situations um, better, more child appropriate, more trauma informed. Um, the pandemic had a, had a big impact on that. Um, as well. But um, despite that, you know, young people were doing amazing things to, to elevate um, mm -hmm. what was happening to them and, and what it was that they needed. And I was wondering if folks wouldn't mind kind of elevating um, as we're kind of coming to the last 10 minutes of our time here. Could you share with us um, what was something, what are some examples of, of youth advocacy um, that happened during the pandemic? Um, how did how did youth overcome um, such so much difficulty, so many challenges? Um, how did youth and their families, you know, make a difference um, for themselves during this time? I can jump in here. There's a, there's a couple of examples that come to mind that, again, I think were, were helped and facilitated by some of the technological changes that that we saw. Um, but last year there. Uh, the U.S. House Crime Subcommittee, uh, that's chaired by uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, had uh, one of the first uh, juvenile justice hearings in quite some time. And there's a number of speakers, including Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative, Marsha Levick from Juvenile Law Center. Uh, one of the speakers was also a young man who was incarcerated um, in Washington State. And it was, we believe, the first time ever that somebody who was currently incarcerated um, as a juvenile had the opportunity to testify uh, before Congress remotely. And even though the substance of the hearing wasn't necessarily focused on the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it was still an incredibly empowering event to hear this young man 
who had you know been accused and convicted of a serious crime describe four members of the committee you know the effective services that he had received that really helped him you know turn his life around and you know get on a, a on a, a good path and do incredible things since he had been incarcerated so much so that he had been invited uh, to testify before members of Congress, which was quite incredible, right? And so I think the use of technology in this way and, and being able to elevate the voices of directly impacted youth has been incredible. And then more directly to the point on on um, the pandemic, one of the most inspiring events that I was a part of back in 2020 uh, was an event that uh, was put together uh, by a number of folks at the Justice Roundtable, um, a group that's run by a woman, uh, used to be run by Nikichi Taifa, it's now run by Cynthia Roseberry at the ACLU, um, and Kemba Walker, who um, uh, also is directly impacted herself. And one of the things that uh, we were able to do during that was get a panel of uh, powerful speakers uh, in place for Speaker Pelosi, uh, Leader Hoyer, a number of other members of leadership um, in the Democratic Caucus in the House. And one of those members happened to be uh, the mother of a young man. He was a 16 year old who was incarcerated who, who in, in the state of Maryland, uh, in violation of the Prison Rape Elimination Act, he was being held in an adult jail in an adult a cell with, with a 40 year old man. Um, and he also suffered from uh, a serious health affliction. And, you know, there was nothing more powerful, I think, in that entire hearing uh, with the speaker and others than for them to hear directly from this mother who was absolutely petrified of the fact that, you know, her son was in this adult facility um, with, a, with grown adult men and that he suffered from the severe illness that had killed his father uh, a year before that. And so, you know, it, it, as a result of that and her incredible testimony, uh, what came about of that was the, the inclusion of every single ask that the juvenile justice community had uh, of Congress uh, in the U.S. House uh, passed HEROES Act, right? And so that included funding for decarceration efforts, encouraging states to remove more and more kids from, uh, from their facilities. And even though that ultimately did not get a hearing in the Senate, uh, that, you know, it did form the basis of subsequent legislation that did get funding uh, to the states. And so, you know, it was examples like that of just incredible courage on the part of both parents as well as the kids to tell their stories in a way that was just very profound for members of Congress. You know, I, I said something about half an hour ago about reduced admissions and increased releases, but that didn't happen on its own. You know, I was really inspired by the family-led advocacy in places like Virginia, uh, where the Bonaire Juvenile Correctional Facility was really keeping secret the number of COVID cases, only releasing them at about 4 or 6 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, um, and family-led protests that happened there. Family-led protests in St. Louis outside the uh, Hogan Street facility, uh, Connecticut, Los Angeles, places where families were organizing to get information about their kids and to urge the release. And I think that that really had an impact on the decisions to hold uh, fewer of them. Uh, Tony, did you have something? Yeah, no, I mean, I was gonna just talk about some foster that you see that happened during the pandemic. Um, for those who don't know, I'm, I'm a former foster youth myself. So just kind of seeing the community kind of rally, and I mean, really rally in the sense of we empowered other foster youth, current and former foster youth, to take up like the mantle of advocacy and really kind of bring voice and bring, you know, this idea of nothing about us without us to the forefront. I mean, that's actually how I got to meet um, Aubrey, Shireen, Jennifer, uh, and Allison is we, we, our organizations would meet on a weekly basis and really empower foster youth um, to fight for their pandemic relief because we knew, right, as we've discussed at the beginning, foster youth and juvenile justice youth were always forgotten. And so when a pandemic hit, we needed to empower them um, and so for about nine months until it passed, we, we really fought for the Supporting Foster Youth and Families through the Pandemic Act, which provided $400 million to older foster youth to make sure that they were not forgotten. Um, and I mean, this took the form of advocacy letters to the White House, meetings with members of Congress, right? Anything and everything that we could do to really bring youth voice to the center because, you know, their story is so powerful and they were facing life and death situations that were already rough. But I mean, this pandemic really brought it to the forefront and you were not going to ignore us, you know, and it was fantastic that we found great allies, um, you know, across the nation. And I will say that's another innovative piece of this is like groups that may never have gotten to contact each other because, you know, everything was done per in person. We were able to make a multi-state, multi of thousands of people coalition 
to really, really, really emphasize their needs and fight for that legislation. And when it passed, um, you know, and we really tried to then implement it, right? It was one of those times as a former FOSS youth and someone who's a professional now in this space for me to bring my, my lived experience and my work experience together and create something beautiful. And to do that with my brothers and sisters in advocacy and brothers and sisters from the foster care system um, is, has definitely been a highlight of my career up to this point and just a highlight of the great work that can happen, you know, in some of the darkest times in our nation's history. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I couldn't, I, I think I'd be remiss not to mention the great work that we all did to make that happen. Jennifer, do you wanna close us out with this? I mean, I just want to say that I think one of the most important contributions that both youth in the youth justice system and youth in foster care made during this time is that so many people in systems have really a failure of imagination around visioning what could be different. And these were young people in California. I saw young people both tracking conditions in um, detention facilities and elevating those up to decision makers and really rallying the community, but also, and I think more importantly, really starting to vision what could a alternative to our existing justice system look like. Um, and the same is true in foster care. Uh, young people started really demanding, you know, we see the world changing that young people are exiting into adulthood in. It's an entirely different economy, you know, entirely different stakes. And so young people started to really reimagine the kind of supports that are going to be necessary if young people thrive in adulthood. And um, and thinking about, you know, yeah, every young person has the right to to be in a family. Every young person has the right to receive guaranteed basic in income. Um, housing should really be a right. So that is the kind of leadership that I've seen and so appreciated um, during this time when so many people were sort of paralyzed in the system with panic and triaging things. Young people were out there visioning, how could we not just fix the problems in front of us, but how could we actually build to, to a better future? Absolutely. Well, we are are coming down to a close of our time. I, I just want to also lift up um, advocacy from from young people who are really making sure that um, that the the abuses that happen inside of institutions um, stop happening. Um, there was so much work that was done, especially I'm thinking um, in the wake and in the remembrance of Cornelius Frederick, who was a, a young man who was in foster care, who passed away and had COVID and was in a, a in a institutional setting. Um, I'm thinking about um, youth advocates like Uvea, who um, advocated in, in October here in DC to, to push for um, changes, right? I think it's just another example of, of young people saying, you know, this is what we need. We need to make sure that we're protected um, and, and stepping up and, and making their voices heard. Um, so there's just so much, so much inspirational advocacy that we're happening from, from young people that really, I mean, for me, just like really fueled um, me to keep, keep in the fight um, as we were um, going through the, just the, an unprecedented time. Um, so if if folks um, don't mind, I know that we will go over time a little bit, but I just wanted to give everybody an opportunity to share just one thing that they want for folks to take away. Um, you know, what what's one action that you want for everyone who's hearing this today to do? Um, and Josh, we'll, we'll start um, with you. Oh, thanks. Boy, you know, I think that the main thing that I would love for the audience to do is push back on the narrative that crime is the worst that it's ever been or that kids are out of control. You know, I track these numbers really closely and the numbers don't exist yet on a nationwide picture about crime for the present year, for even last year. But what we have is anecdotes and the plural of anecdote is not data. Um, and when we have this atmosphere that is so heavily based in fear, bad decisions are going to be made. Um, I know that we have a lot of congressional staffers watching. The idea that we can respond to crime by criminalizing youth has been disproven for decades now. And regardless of what those numbers eventually show, I think we need to understand what is best for kids is not criminalizing and not giving them harsh outcomes. 
but just push back on the very idea that, that crime is somehow out of control when it is not. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Josh. Jennifer? Sure. Um, you know, I think if, if I were going to recommend one action moving forward for folks, it would be to, to say you have to listen to young people and families. Um, and so those are those are birth families. They're also the resource and foster families that are in the system. I think during the pandemic, what we learned is that families are the system's most important intervention. Um, institutional care cannot be an intervention. It hurts more than it helps. Um, detention is not going to be the intervention. It's our youth and families that really hold the key. And it's very important to ask them, what do they need so that they can um, so that our families can be caring for young people outside of those structures. And I think that, like you heard today, some of the answers that you're going to hear are not actually the typical answers. They're not, we need more therapeutic care or sort of heart, a deep end invasive treatment, but they're going to be very basic things. Like we need to make sure that there's access to extracurricular and art and cultural and sports activities and funding for, for those kind of um, things. We need to make sure that when there are people who are system folks who come into our life, that they are there to habilitate, they are there to help, they are there to actually listen and respond and not just surveil. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And thanks for being here. I know that you need to hop off. Thanks for being with us today. Um, let's let's go to James. Yeah, uh, you know, a couple of things. One would just be to, you know, for all of us to develop an understanding of the impact of, uh, of trauma on children. And, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic was an incredibly traumatic event. I mean, think about all of us and adults like who ran around like scared masks, you know, uh, didn't go out, were terrified of getting COVID, like all of that stuff. And then imagine the kids who were in these facilities um, who didn't have proper PPE, who didn't have the ability to socially distance. And, you know, particularly those with underlying health conditions and the, the fear that that, you know, really instills in them. And so those were traumatic events. And, you know, Brian Stevenson in his remarks last year talked about the fact that there's an epidemic of childhood trauma in this country. And when there's an epidemic of childhood trauma, oftentimes what that leads to when it goes unaddressed or unmitigated is that children act out. Um, and so when we encounter youth in the juvenile or criminal legal system, it's really, really important that we understand the root causes for how those kids ended up there in the system. There are no ki bad kids. Uh, no child is born bad, as my good friend Xavier McAuliffe Bay at the Campaign for the Fair Sentence of Youth likes to say. Um, there are bad things that happen to children and then they act out as a result of that. And so that's a significant part of that. And it's important to really uh, root everything that we do in that recognition. And then as a tangible action, item you know i you know aubrey and, and uh, us along with uh, a number of other folks are working on a, a number of reforms that are currently pending in congress um including uh the abolishing uh, trafficking uh, reauthorization act that was just introduced yesterday by senator cornyn and, and senator klobuchar has a number of important juvenile justice reform provisions in place for kids who've experienced trauma there's a package of house bills including uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass's Childhood Offenders Rehabilitation Act. Um, There's so many reforms that you could go to either one of our websites and we have information up there. If you're a staffer on this call, I'd encourage you uh, to uh, have your boss sign on as a co-sponsor to these bipartisan legislative reforms um, and, and really prioritize kids as uh, we move through uh, the next phase of this pandemic, particularly kids in the, in, in the juvenile justice system. Awesome, thanks, James. Shereen? Thanks so much, Aubrey. Um, I think one <clears throat> point that I just want to leave for people to continue to reflect on was something that I mentioned uh, during the discussion, which is we really need to think about surveillance and we really need to think about the ways in which we show up and support children and their families. And we can't support children without also supporting their families. Um, and so I would just encourage people to think about surveillance, mandated reporting, and what needs to change. And I'll also lift up a resource that I think everybody should look at, which is um, the Impact had this really cool resource where they invited people who were in foster care and uh, former foster care youth to 
submit submissions about how COVID was impacting them. And they have all of these essays from young people and they're spelling out how COVID impacted them as young people in foster care and involved in the system. And there are so many things put out there. And I think we all should read those and understand from the voices of those young people what they were experiencing. Yeah. Thanks so much for that, Shireen. Allison, do you want to share next? Um, one final thought I'd like to share is um, we didn't talk too much about uh, the pause on court hearings and access to attorneys and access to um, access to justice that happened, but the, many places, family courts and dependency courts were deprioritized uh, behind many other types of hearings, criminal and civil. And the, the main message I'd like to leave the audience with is that youth access to their legal rights, to due process and access to justice is an essential service. It is not a privilege, it is not an amenity, it is an essential service that needs to always stay in place um, no matter what is going on. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. Tony, did you have anything that you wanted to, to close out with? I'll just close out with kind of the same thing that we've kind of started and we, we did some level setting. These problems are not new but a solution to them is long overdue. And I, I didn't mean to rhyme, but I just realized that's what it happened. <laughs> um, but COVID didn't change anything other than making these problems more pressing. And so I would really encourage every single person to understand that until we have substantive reform in the juvenile justice and the child welfare system for everyone who touches them, parents, families, biological, adopted, foster, otherwise, we are gonna continue to have some negative outcomes that we don't want, that we can no longer afford and we can make changes. Yes, it will be hard, but every good thing that this country has ever achieved has been difficult. So let's dig deep, do it together, and let's get it done because it shouldn't take a pandemic for us to get this right. We owe it to these young people. Absolutely. We have to put them first. I think that's what I would end with, which is probably why I work at First Focus on Children, right? We have to put that first. What, what, children and youth and young people who've been in this system's need um, is for us to be able to put aside what's easy for the administration, um, put aside what you know allows them to, to submit reports, um, but really what makes an impact on, on children's lives has to be the focus of what we're doing and we have to listen um, to, to them first. Um, in order to, to be able to craft solutions. So thank you everyone for being a part of this conversation. Um, and if you have any questions um, for us or for any of the panelists, please feel free to um, contact um, Haley W, so H-A-L-E-Y-W at firstfocus.org. And we'll make sure to um, field your question to, to whomever um, or you're getting in contact with any of the panelists who are on today. Thanks again for um, tuning in with us today and um, hope you have a good rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Tony. <laughs>